On December 27, 1892, Livingstone and Biddle College, now known as Johnson C. Smith University, played in Salisbury, North Carolina, with Biddle winning 5-0. Over time, HBCU football has evolved. HBCU football's popularity continues to rise. Millions attend games each year and millions more watch on television. The HBCU bands provide some of the top entertainment in the country. Over that time, some of the best players to ever play in the National Football League played at HBCUs. Every Monday through Friday on the HBCU Football Daily Podcast, national radio and television host Donald Ware takes a look at what's happening in HBCU football and talks with coaches, players, administrators, and media about the season. Make sure you join the conversation on social media now. Here's your host, Donald Ware. You've got it locked to the HBCU Football Daily Podcast for today, Friday, July 28th. I'm Donald Ware. Wait for it. Wait for it. It's Friday. Hope you've enjoyed the HBCU Football Daily Podcast in week one as we take a look, uh, mostly preview this week, the HBCU football season. And with that being said, just a week ago, I was in Norfolk for the MEAC Media Day. It had been since 2019 since I had been to the MEAC Media Day. And it was just, again, um, much like the SWAC, some good camaraderie with uh, some fellow uh, uh, media members. We had a chance to catch up with Charlie, the legendary Charlie Neal, talk with him a little bit, uh, Dr. Cavill, Mark Gray, and uh, and many others, and just seeing some of the sports information directors that I hadn't uh, seen in quite some time. Uh, it just felt really, really good to be back at MEAC Media Day. Now, of course, when you think about MEAC Media Day, and I talked about the SWAC and its media day, I mean, there's not as many media members uh, in Norfolk uh, covering the respective schools. There are six MEAC teams. Nonetheless, still a lot of information to be gotten from the six coaches and the uh, two players for each institution. And so uh, it was a really good time. As a matter of fact, things kicked off with the uh, the MEAC uh, Men's Empowerment Breakfast. The speaker there was Antoine Bethay, who played his collegiate ball at Howard and played 13 seasons in the National Football League, mostly with the Indianapolis Colts, who originally drafted him in 2006 uh, in the sixth round out of Howard. He also played with the San Francisco 49ers and the New York Giants. And a, a quick, uh, quick story, I, I think, when Antoine spoke, I mean, he had a lot of really great things to say uh, to the in the players uh, were listening intently. As a matter of fact, afterwards, um, sometime afterwards, I mean, everybody wanted to take a photo with him. After all, he's a three time pro bowler, Super Bowl champion in his first year uh, up until maybe 10 or 11 seasons in every game he played in, which he played. I mean, he only had, he had one season where he really got injured, but for the most part, he, uh, he, 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 in every game he played in, he started for about first 10, 11 seasons of his career. So just an absolutely phenomenal career. Um, he came on box to row back in 2006, two weeks before the NFL draft. As a matter of fact, that year, that was the first year that we, uh, we had as guests players that had an opportunity to be drafted into the National Football League. And I think that year there were three players from HBCUs, may have been more, but three that I can think about. Uh, and as a matter of fact, not, not only was it Antoine, but they it was uh, Tavares Jackson, rest in peace, Tavares Jackson, who was drafted in the third round by the Minnesota Vikings, of course, went on to uh, win a Super Bowl with the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, there was Jason Hatcher, who was drafted. Mm, can't remember the round, second, third, or fourth round uh, by the Cowboys out of Grambling and uh, went on to have a very nice career with the Cowboys and then in the in the then Washington Redskins. And uh, there was Bruce Eugene. You talk about one of the great quarterbacks, not only in HBCU history, uh, but, but from a prolific standpoint, also one of the great quarterbacks in Division I AA or FCS history as well. Talk with all of those guys 
um, that year. I think Antoine was first up. And so over the years, really had a chance um, to catch up with Antoine. He all, you know, mostly always come on box to row. We would talk. As a matter of fact, I can remember his first year in the league, again, a starter playing the strong safety position and um, I, I covered I covered the Super Bowl, the Super Bowl 41. Uh, it was in Miami. So we were there the whole week, did the did box to row on Radio Row. It was absolutely fantastic and uh, really had a chance to cover the Colts because the Colts had three HBCU players, uh, Antoine Bethay, Robert Mathis, one of the greats of all time. As a matter of fact, um, in ranking the top, um, I had a chance for uh, USA Today asked me back in 2019 to rank the top 100 National Football League players who played at HBCUs. And certainly Antoine was on my list uh, of the top 100. So was Robert Mathis for that uh, matter. But then also Nick Harper, who played. Uh, so uh, you think about Mathis, he played at Alabama A&M when Alabama A&M was in the SIAC, uh, covered him. Uh, during that time, uh, the Super Bowl with the Colts, and then also uh, Nick Harper, who played at Fort Valley State as well, with the Colts winning the Super Bowl 41 uh, that year. So that was a great time. And as a matter of fact, also Leslie Frazier, because remember, Tony Dungy was the head coach. Leslie Frazier was also, I think, assistant head coach, but defensive coordinator uh, for that squad. He went on to, of course, become um, a head coach or the head coach of the Minnesota Vikings for many, many years. So it was great to be able to cover um, all of those gentlemen and, and particularly Antoine that year. had a lot of great things to say at the Empowerment Breakfast, doing a lot in the community. And that's one of the questions he asked, what are you What are you doing? What are you going to do in the community um, to, um, uh, to help those that are really in need? And that's something that he certainly is doing. When you look at the MEAC, for the 2023 season. And one of the things we're going to talk about on the weekend edition of Box to Row, what's the better conference in terms of football on the field, whether it's not just this past season, but maybe over a five or six year period? Uh, is it the MEAC or the SWAC? That's one of the questions we're going to ask and talk about on the weekend edition of Box to Row, which can be heard on a radio station near you as well as on uh, tonight, as a matter of fact, Sirius XM Channel 84, College Sports uh, Sirius XM, uh, that's Channel 84, 6 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Central Time, and 3 p.m. Pacific Time. And then also uh, tomorrow, Sirius XM Channel 142, the HBCU Channel, 9 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Central Time, and 6 a.m. Pacific time as well. Then again, on a radio station near you, you can log on to boxtorow.com to find a radio station in your area that carries the program. Without question, North Carolina Central picked to win the MIAC. There's no surprise there. Uh, you have an Eagle team that's got Davius Richard, arguably last year, the best all around quarterback in HBCU football. He's one of the best quarterbacks in FCS was responsible for 40 touchdowns last year, 40 of them. I believe offhand it was either 24, I think it was 24 uh, passing and then 16 rushing, and he had a really, really good celebration bowl um, as well. On the other side of the football for North Carolina Central, Khalil Baker, one of the best in FCS in terms of defensive back. So you've got those two gentlemen coming back. I think that's absolutely big time for North Carolina Central in the defense of its MEAC and HBCU National Championship. And they've got some other people. Now, North Carolina Central lost some pieces. And if you if you had a chance uh, on Monday to check out the HBCU Football Daily Podcast, we did a replay of the conversation or part uh, a replay of the conversation we had with Trey Oliver back uh, a couple of weeks ago from our countdown to kickoff. And we talked, he talked about the transfer portal and not being – uh, a fan of the transfer portal. He lost a couple of guys, a couple of really big players to the transfer portal. That said, he's got um, a good offensive line coming back, good defensive line coming back. It's going to be a good team there uh, in Durham. You know, I'm going to say this. Um, I like North Carolina Central to repeat. Um, 
much like I thought last year coming off of the 2021 season. You know, I, I, I thought that the MIAC would be much improved um, last year. And um, it, it, it that, you know, it, you know, as I think back, I mean, South Carolina State definitely took a step back last year. We'll talk more about that. Norfolk State, I thought, took a step back as well. We'll talk more about that. Delaware State didn't play up to what I thought Delaware State would be in 2022. Howard, I think, took a step forward last year. Um, and Morgan took a step forward last year uh, as well. So I really expect the MEAC as a whole uh, to take a step forward because, uh, listen, Central is going to be good now. The Eagles can't be complacent. I think that's what happened a little bit at the South Carolina State on last year. Because yeah, basically everybody coming back from the previous year, yet the Bulldogs only won uh, three football games coming off an HBCU national championship. Um, I think Howard, I'm going to talk more about Howard. I think Howard's going to be improved uh, even more so than last year. Uh, Morgan State definitely is going to be improved. I don't think Norfolk State's only going to win two games. We'll see about Delaware State, but you got Lee Hall there, who last when he was in the MIAC was having some success as the head coach at Morgan State before he went off to the National Football League. So I think the MIAC as a whole is going to be improved. My dark horse, I, my dark horse is Howard. My dark horse is Howard um, this year uh, in terms of possibly winning the MIAC. Now, I, I think the Eagles are going to win, but I, I like Howard. Uh, I know last year it didn't sit necessarily well uh, with uh, NCCU that Howard was named uh, co MIAC champs, and I'm you know I'm glad the MIAC is sort of getting rid of that rule because just because both teams have the same amount of uh, wins and losses, you know, shouldn't constitute a co-championship, particularly if last year the two teams played, North Carolina Central beat Howard head-to-head. -head. That said, I think when you have Quentin Williams coming back um, as the quarterback, he's he, he, he really took a step forward last year from 2021. Uh, and this is, the, I think, I think last year is what the expectation of Quentin Williams had been for quite some time. And I think he can, he's not going to do anything, uh, but get better in 2023. On the other side, you've got a Kenny Gallup, um, who's really, really good uh, in the defensive backfield. Um, you know, you've also got a Casey Hawthorne uh, at wide receiver. You've got a Brennan Brown um, at uh, tight end. You know, the offensive line, I think it's going to be solid as well defensively. I think the Bison going to be good uh, as well there. So I, I, I Howard as a dark horse, um, you know, I like the Eagles to win, but I think Howard's going to be really, really good um, as well based upon the players uh, that I named also. And then, you know, I look at a team like a Morgan State with Damon Wilson in his second season. Had a lot of success at Bowie State. I think four wins last year was uh, considering and 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 listen uh Morgan State had Alonzo Graham uh, as the running back he was uh, a, a, a a a huge and integral part of that Morgan State defense um you look at the quarterback in uh in Carson Baker he got hurt last year he was having a decent season got hurt second year in the offense they expect big things uh from him uh, on this year uh, but that's a big loss. Of course, Alonzo Graham signing a contract, actually, uh, with the Pittsburgh Steelers. So now he's uh, a Steeler. So that's a that's a big loss, um, no doubt about it. Um, but they're expecting, uh, you know, a Jabril Johnson running back. They like it should have been it, it, it was uh, destined to be a one two a combination. And then Alonzo Graham just went to another level, uh, as you can see by him being uh, not drafted, but of course, signing. Uh, a uh, what did, I think he signed what was it a three year, a uh, little bit uh, almost three million dollar deal um, with the uh, with Morgan State. Uh, so they you know he just really emerged and was really you know the offense. Um, you know Carson Baker they expect improvement from him. He's got a couple of receivers and Andre Crawley and Damon Hambler. They combined for uh, forty seven receptions for close to. Uh, 600 yards last year and four touchdowns. So they're expecting uh, that. But I think where the Bears are going to make 
the real impact is defensively. And we saw where the Bears had some impact. Elijah Williams, defensive tackle, 19 tackles for loss last year, eight sacks. I mean, he's going to be right there on that defensive line. I think the defensive line is going to be really, really good. Um, the Bears were number one in the MEAC in terms of sacks with 29 and in terms of uh, points given up per game at 20. But the numbers everywhere else were not good. Well, I think that's going to be much, much improved on this year. Linebacker Lawrence Richardson's a first-team all-MEAC preseason guy, uh, defensive back. Uh, JV on Morton in the in the defensive secondary as well. I think the Bears are going to be really, really strong on the defensive side of the football. Then from a special teams perspective, you've got an HBCU All-American in Keith Richardson. Um, that's a returning as a kick returner. Uh, more so had two touchdowns on kick return. So, you know, I think Morgan's going to be improved um, this year as well. I, I think South Carolina State refocuses uh, this year. Got most of the team uh, coming back from 2021 that won or a good a good part. I mean, you know, Shaq Davis, not so much, but but a, but a good part of the team that really played well uh, in 2000 or played well, well really down the stretch and then won that HBCU National Championship. Um, returning as well, uh, Godbolt and Green on your defensive ends. Yeah, they lose a B.J. Davis, but uh, as good a player as he was, I mean, South Carolina State really keeps – linebackers they keep good defensive they they keep good uh mostly i would say in the defensive second they're always going to be good in the defensive secondary i mean if you look in the national football league i mean you can make an argument the two top hbcu players in the national football league both out of south carolina state and javon hargrave who just signed a massive deal uh to come from the eagles to now san francisco that's going to bolster that defensive line which was already pretty good anyway uh and then you look at um the maniac, Shaq Litter, um, who uh, is coming off injury, but arguably two the, the two best HBC players, both came out of South Carolina State. And, and uh, Leonard specifically, linebacker, right, but sort of sort of uh, can run, you know, like a linebacker that can run and keep up with, you know, keep up with running backs and, you know, big enough to be able to bring down and to be able to check a tight end as well. And just in that defensive, on that defensive side of the football, I mean, you're talking about a South Carolina state team that's generally, generally good across the board. So even though Davis is lost, um, I, the Bulldogs feel good uh, about the defense as a whole and at that linebacking court. You got to figure that Norfolk State's going to be better um, this year as well, Chris, uh, I mean, Otto Coons returns as the quarterback, but it's not out of the question that uh, Norfolk State could use a two quarterback system, which it did uh, from time to time on last year as well. I, you know, I was surprised uh, and, and going going back to uh, Morgan's uh, to um, uh, speaking of actually of, of Norfolk State, J.J. Davis didn't get a lot of touches. Now, remember, he was coming off a really good season in 2021 and a really special season back in 2019 before the pandemic. And uh, he's now signed with Morgan State. So that's going to boost Morgan State's backfield as well. But um, Norfolk feels good uh, about Jordan Lennon and uh, Kavon King combined to rush for close to 700 yards and four touchdowns on last year. Um, so I think Norfolk uh, not not going to be worse than it was last year. Delaware State had, I think, a solid season last year. Lost some guys, right? But Lee Hall comes in. He's back in the MEAC. You know, we'll see what happens um, with Delaware State and if Delaware State can, in fact, be improved um, in uh, uh, or take that, take another step or that next step because I thought Delaware State, Delaware State sort of folded a little bit at the end. Um, because they the Hornets started out really, really good last year, just couldn't get it done. I mean, uh, you know, just needed to win a few more games down the stretch, couldn't get it done, and it kept the door open for Central. Because if you remember at the time, Central had a that it was a big loss, um, to Norfolk State. It's a big loss. Oh, uh, excuse me, to uh, Howard. It's only loss in the MEAC. Uh, excuse me, not to Howard, South Carolina State to South Carolina State. Um, it was a big loss, and it, and it just left the door open. But ultimately, um, the Eagles held on to get the MIAC championship. So that's a look at the MIAC. I, I, I think uh, I said that the MIAC would be improved. I think it will, in fact, be improved um, this year. 
uh, in 2023. So those are my thoughts on the MEAC this year as we wrap up this week's HBCU Football Daily Podcast. As always, as always we want you to tell a friend about the HBCU Football Daily Podcast. If, you, if you're not a subscriber to the Box to Row YouTube page, where not only we have this great HBCU Football Daily Podcast Monday through Friday uh, here uh, on our YouTube channel, uh, as well as on box rowcom and iHeartMedia. Dot com. We've got other great conversations um, on the Box to Row YouTube channel, so check us out. Um, don't forget about the weekend edition of Box to Row, which can be heard on a radio station uh, near you, as I mentioned, as well as tonight, Sirius XM Channel 84, that's 6 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Central Time, and 3 p.m. Pacific Time. And tomorrow, Sirius XM Channel 142, 9 a.m. Eastern, 8 Central and six Pacific time. Have a wonderful weekend, and I'll talk with you on Monday. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the HBCU Football Daily Podcast. You can also listen to the podcast at BoxToRow.com, iHeartMedia, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to get your HBCU football fix on Box to Row with Donald Ware each weekend on the radio station near you and on Sirius XM on HBCU, Channel 142, and on ESPNU Radio on Sirius XM, Channel 84. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at at Box to Row for the latest in HBCU football and don't forget to tell a friend.